Do you know that person who's always quiet and cool? Would you believe they are capable of hurting someone? When a teenage boy disappeared, no one could have imagined that the quiet and innocent looking boy in his class was behind everything. Let's dive in. Lee Manuel Viholoria Paulino was the type of person that everyone just liked. He was funny, kind, and sensitive, and was always helping out whenever he could. He loved art, music, and poems, and aspired to be a writer. Lee grew up in Lawrence, Massachusetts, though his family was originally from the Dominican Republic. He lived in a huge household that included his mom, grandma, uncles, and other relatives. Lee was super close with his family, most especially his grandma. Every day after school, he would come home happily singing, and he would hug and kiss his grandmother and say, I love you, Grandma, and his grandma would reply, I love you more. That's so sweet, right? Lee Manuel went to Lawrence High School and was friends with a boy named Matthew Borges. There's a lot of conflicting information about the kind of person Matthew was. While some people described him as quiet, smart, and helpful, others saw another side of him, describing him as a troubled person with serious anger problems. Matthew was dating a girl called Leilani de Jesus, but they broke up when Matthew accused her of being unfaithful. But even after the breakup, Matthew was still so possessed of her and hated seeing her with some other boys. He would get extremely jealous and angry if Leilani so much as spoke to another guy in school. So one day in the cafeteria, Leilani was joking around with Lee and Matthew saw them, he totally lost it. He started shouting and making a scene and a teacher had to escort him out, but that was not the end of it. On November 18th, 2016, Lee had just eaten dinner with his family and was resting in his room when he got a call from Matthew. A CCTV camera captured the two teenagers talking and heading towards the local Merrimack River. This was the last time Lee would ever be seen alive. The following morning when they tried to call him down for breakfast, Lee was nowhere to be found. His room was completely messed up and some of his things were missing. But weirdly, the most essential things such as his phone, wallet, and keys were still in the house. It was unlike Lee to go off like that without telling anyone. His family was worried that something bad had happened to him. They searched around the neighborhood and called all his friends, but no one had seen or heard from him. After hours of searching without results, they called the cops. Investigators soon found out that Matthew was the last person to see Lee before he disappeared. And when Matthew was interviewed, he told investigators that he and Lee had gone there to and that they parted ways afterwards. He insisted that he had no idea where Lee was and said that he learned about Lee's disappearance the next day at work. The girl I was talking to told me, she said, have you seen Lee? I was like, yeah, I was with him the other day. And I was like, why, why haven't she said he's missing? I was like, why? He even took the detectives to the south side of the riverbank where he said he last saw Lee. Two weeks went by without any lead as to what happened to Lee and his family was getting desperate. They could not understand why the police were taking so long to find their son and thought their son's disappearance was not being taken with the seriousness it deserved. Then on December 1st, a man walking his dog noticed something suspicious floating in the water. He went closer to check and was horrified to realize it was a human corpse. The body had no head and hands but the coroner was able to determine that it was Lee. His head was later found by a state trooper who saw a plastic bag bobbing in the river. He pulled it ashore with a stick and found it was weighed down with rocks. But when he opened it, he was shocked to find a human head. Lee's hands have never been found. An autopsy report showed that Lee had been brutally stabbed 76 times. And what's even more disturbing, they could not tell if some wounds and the beheading happened before or after he drew his last breath. This means that Lee might have been alive during the entire ordeal. That's just awful. I can't imagine the pain he must have gone through before he finally passed on. Everyone in the community was shocked that something so horrible could happen so close to their homes. They were even more terrified to think there was a cold-blooded killer hiding among them. A vigil was held at school as friends and family gathered to remember the kind-hearted and humble boy who was always happy. Why would someone want to hurt him? Lee's family was totally devastated. His mom, Kastuka Polino, believed that that the police could have done more to help find her son. If it was their kid, would they had looked would they have wait two weeks? to look for him. The last person who was seen with Lee was Matthew. So investigators started talking to everyone who knew Lee, and that's when things started to unravel. Some of Lee's classmates told investigators that Matthew had wanted to break into Lee's home and steal his PlayStation, belts, and clothes. He said that he was going to lure Matthew out of the house while his four friends robbed Lee. But after the robbery, the friends said that Matthew called them and said, I killed him, he's dead. He even told one that he had chopped Lee's head and hands off so he wouldn't be caught. His friends said that Matthew 
Matthew usually said weird stuff like that, so they didn't take him seriously. But he was serious, as the detectives would find out. And this was not a spur of the moment thing. Matthew had actually planned to take Lee's life. A few days before Lee disappeared, he had sent a message to his former girlfriend saying, and I quote, I think of someone and I smirk. It's all I think about every day, but I can't control myself. I like the sound of it. The idea of causing pain in someone getting in my way. He also made it clear that he didn't like her talking to other boys. Then sent some more incriminating texts to the girl saying that he believed a person's eyes changed when they take someone's life. Take a good look at my eyes the next time we talk because that's the last time you're going to see them like that ever again. How dumb is this? You're about to commit a horrible crime and you decide to tell people about it? He naively thought the girl would keep his secret and not report him, but he was mistaken. And his own words were used to arrest and charge him with first degree homicide. The most incredible thing about all of this is that the police had no physical evidence against and he probably would have gotten away with it. His arrest came as a shock to some of his classmates who tried to defend him, saying that he was not capable of hurting anyone. He has common sense. He's a type of kid that has common sense. I don't believe the fact that he would do that because it's it's just not him. But clearly, they don't know him that well, and he managed to fool them. The trial took place in 2018 in Salem, Massachusetts. Matthew was 18 years old at the time and had spent three years in juvie. Due to the seriousness of the crime, Matthew was tried as an adult, despite the fact that he was only 15 when it happened. His ex-girlfriend, Leilani, was among the first people to testify against him, and she told the court how jealous he was when he thought she was flirting with Lee. Another one of his friends also told the court that Matthew had confessed to him that he had taken Lee's life. He killed Lee and cut off his head. Did he tell you how he killed him? No. Uh -oh. He said Though the defense argued that there was no physical evidence that linked Matthew to the crime, the prosecution brought in the incriminating text messages and something else that sealed his fate. Apparently, Matthew loved writing in his diary, and he would write about everything, including how he intended to take Lee's life. The prosecution read a chilling part on the journal that sounded a lot like a to-do list. Go chill with him at his crib alone. Drink, smoke, and play it off. Kill him. Bring duffel bag, wear gloves gloves, clean up mess, wear bags on shoes, wear clothes you don't care about. That's just messed up. Like, who does that? Writing a to-do list of taking someone's life as if you're going to buy groceries? This guy is clearly sick. The trial went on for nine days, and in the end, the jury found Matthew guilty of first-degree homicide. But it was not over yet. During the sentencing hearing, the defense tried to get the judge to give Matthew a shorter sentence, saying that he was only a minor when he committed the crime. However, Lee's devastated mom tearfully read an impact statement in which she described her son as a dreamer, writer, and a poet who loved his family and was always bringing everyone together. When I was the driving force behind us, behind so many of the activities we used to do and loved bringing the family together. She even called him their oxygen, saying her entire family was having a hard time living without Lee Manuel. She asked the judge to give Matthew a life sentence so that he doesn't get the chance to hurt someone else. I feel that this criminal deserves to spend his life in carcerity, so at very least, it serves to keep him off the street. He should never have the opportunity to kill the guy to rob another person of their life like he did to leave alone. Finally, the judge gave Matthew two life sentences and ordered that he would serve a minimum of 30 years to life in prison before the chance of parole. There is no sentence that I can impose that will bring back Lee Polino uh, or that will um, answer the questions that we all have about how this could happen um, and how a 15-year-old boy could kill a friend in this manner. Can you believe that? If he was old enough to commit such a horrible crime, shouldn't he be old enough to face the consequences? Such a crime would normally get someone a life sentence without the possibility of parole. But the state of Massachusetts decided it was against the law to convict a teenager to life sentence without parole. While his sentence was being read, Matthew just stood there with a blank stare on his face. He also remained quiet throughout the trial and didn't even bother to show any remorse for his action. By the time he gets out, he'll be in his late 40s. While I'm happy that he's going to be away for a long time, I still feel that age should not be considered in such brutal crimes. This guy took an innocent person's life in cold blood. Whether he was a teenager at the time should not have mattered. Lee had a whole life ahead of him, and Matthew mercilessly took that away from him. He left a family sad and devastated, and they may never get over such a loss. It's hard enough to lose a loved one, but losing them in such a manner is traumatizing. I do hope that the pain will become more bearable with time. Rest in peace, Lee Manuel. That's the end of our video today. What do you think about this case? Does Matthew deserve parole? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section.